I am Brad Johnson, and on today's episode, we are going to talk about why men need to be part of the solution on gender equity. We're going to talk about how guys need to put aside their egos and actually listen to women and ask to ask about their experiences. And we're also going to talk about why guys need to disrupt in that meeting where that sexist joke happens. He's got to say, ouch, and stop it. Congratulations. You are tuned into Dolph Barron's Leadership and Loyalty Show, the number one podcast for Fortune 500 executives and those who are dedicated to creating a quantum leap in leadership. Your host, Dolph Barron, he's an executive mentor to leaders like you, a contributing writer for Entrepreneur Magazine, CEO World, and he's been featured on CNN, Fox, CBS, and many other notable sites. Dov Barron is an international business speaker who was named by Inc. Magazine as one of the top 100 leadership speakers to hire. Now, over to Dov Barron. Welcome, dear friends, fans, and fellow aficionados. Thank you for joining us on this Leadership and Loyalty Tips for Executives. What do you need to do to up-level your leadership? Well, consider this. You're a good guy, right? You believe in gender equality? So how can you and I be better allies to women in the workplace? There again, maybe you are a woman leading the equality charge in your organization. How do you guide the men in your organization to create safety for women and for for men who support women to be champions for each other? Well, stay tuned because that's where we're going on today's show. I'm your host, Dove Barron, and I'm here to assist you tapping into the one thing in your business that changes everything by transforming meaning into action. Curious to know more? Simply go to DoveBaron.com. That's D-O-V-B-A-R-O-N.com. This episode of Leadership and Loyalty is brought to you in part by our other podcast, Curiosity Bites. Curiosity Bites is the answer to the question, how can we bring people together who normally would completely disagree? This is exactly what your heart, your mind, and your soul have been craving. It's your chance to sit in on some real and often intense conversations with some of the world's most interesting people. We're talking about astronauts, neuroscientists, philosophers, holy people, quantum physicists, entrepreneurs, skeptics, multi-Grammy award-winning entertainers, People you would might think would you would completely disagree with who are truly fascinating. Simply go to dovebaron.com and find out how you can sign up for and sink your teeth into the delicious Curiosity Bites. As always, you can find both of our shows on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, or wherever it is that you tune into podcasts. And we always need your help in staying relevant. So please get over there, wherever there is. Do us a favor, rate, review, and subscribe to the show. If you are a regular listener, a big thank you to you for making us the number one podcast globally for Fortune 500 listeners. And we are honored and grateful to be cited by Inc.com as the number one podcast to make you a better leader. Again, thank you for sharing the show with everybody you know. All right, let's strip it down and dive right in. Just for a moment, I would like you to stop and consider that we are living in the second decade of the 21st century. Now, If you're my age or around my age, I want you to think back when you were a kid and think about what you thought the 21st century would be. We have already overcome the challenges of sending spaceships to Mars, and yet women still don't have equality in the workplace. What's more, many women still don't even feel safe in the workplace. Now, let me be clear. There are many, many good men out there who are champions for women. However, there are many more good guys who, for whatever reason, are not sure how to stand up for gender equality, for diversity, for inclusion, or to simply be vocal about being great allies. So what can we all do to be better? Well, stay tuned, because that's what we're about to find out with our guest today. Our guests today are returning champions, no less, Dr. David Smith and Dr. Brad Johnson. Brad Johnson is a professor, <laughs> professor of U.S. Naval Academy in Johns Hopkins University. He is a mentor and gender workplace expert 
who speaks to audiences around the world. Dr. David Johnson is the author of new, uh, Dr. Brad Johnson rather, is the author of numerous publications, including 14 books in the areas of mentoring, professional ethics, and gender inclusion. With him today is his co-author, Dr. David Smith. He is an associate professor of sociology in the College of Leadership and Ethics at the U.S. Naval War College. A former Navy pilot, Dr. Smith led diverse organizations of women and men, culminating in a command of a squadron in combat and flew more than 3,000 hours in 30 years. David and Brad are the co-authors of The Good Guy of Good Guys, How Men Can Be Better Allies for Women in the Workplace, and their previous book which of course we talked about before, which was Athena Rising. And you can find out about that. Actually, if you scroll back or just search them in your podcast, you'll find that they're right there. And, that, and Athena Rising was about how men, uh, how and why men should mentor women. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together and help me to welcome the dynamic duo of men championing women in the workplace, the good guys, Dr. David Smith and Rick Johnson. <laughs> All right, let's. Good, Good to be back, back with you, Dub. Thanks, Dub, for having us back. Always a pleasure, gents. I can't tell you how many people I recommended you to uh, to go on other shows. I recommended you to for for speaking gigs. Uh, I, you know, Athena Rising was a great book. I loved reading it, and I loved sharing it with others. And you know, I'm loved that you're coming back with another level of this and jumping into it. And as I said in the previous podcast, you know, military guys doing this work, gotta love that. So let's just start here because this is an important piece. You know, there's a lot of questions today about leadership and, and all in their own way, very valid. But in the context of leadership development, what do you believe is the question we should be looking for answers to that we're kind of not? You know, there's always these things that are glaring but what, what, what's the question we need to be looking for the answers to that we're just ignoring? Either of you would be great. Yeah, yeah that's a great question, Dove. And I think, you know, when it comes to this topic in particular about how we can think about creating equity and equality in the workplace, I think often maybe we're asking the wrong question about, you know, why, you know, why don't we have more diversity or why haven't we achieved this? You, as you mentioned in your intro, but the fact that we've been at this for how many decades now and, and yeah. we're still talking about it today. And I think you know, that's one of the challenges, but maybe one of the questions is why, you know, what's keeping the most uh, diverse talent out there, the most qualified people out there from applying or, or working for me and my company, my organization? What's What's holding them back from being there today, and as opposed to, you know, the the other question that we typically ask ourselves, and why, you know, why don't we have more of this there? Mm. Yeah, and, oh, yeah, and I would I would add, Dove, that you know, a big question I think we're not asking is why we keep framing gender equity and gender diversity as a gender thing or a women's issue. That's usually how this lands, right? You you mm. have an event you're trying to get more women into leadership or retain more women. We frame this as a gender thing and we should be framing this as a leadership thing, right? Because when men hear, hey, that's a women's thing, a women's initiative, women's mentoring, women's leadership, they tune out and they think, oh, that's, that's not for me. So we're asked, we're framing this the wrong way. This is a fundamental leadership issue because we, I mean, you look at all of the data showing that any company that gets better at not just diversity, but actually real uh, representation of women all the way up into the C-suite, they're just making more money. You know, they're more creative, they're more productive, they're, they're geared for long-term success. Um, so this is a bottom line business issue. And if men don't hear it that way, that this is part of your leadership brand, they're not gonna show up and be part of this conversation. Yeah, it's it's very interesting to me that I'm seeing this as sort of headlines. You know, um, I was seeing even even as little as two years ago, you know, a woman CEO, uh, you know, a woman leader or, or mm -hmm. female leader, and and then now I'm seeing the red line through that, right. <laughs> just leader. 
Right. And I love that, right? Because what the heck? I mean, you know, why does it say gay leader? Why does it say woman leader? Why does this? It doesn't say Chinese leader. It doesn't say Pakistani leader. It doesn't say American leader. It doesn't say British leader. You know, I mean, it's not a, you don't need those badges in front of it. It's just leader. And now you, whatever you are, are going to have to step up and be measured as that rather than based on some other category. So those are really good points, gents. Thank you for, for going there. I, I want to start with you, Brad, um, because you're a guy, obviously. You're a man, former military officer. You've done your military service academy. You know, uh, that doesn't sound like the perfect opening for working in, in, general, <laughs> in gender equity. So why was there such an interest for you in yeah. equity and equality um, when sort of, I guess the best way of saying it is you really from the man's world, you know what I mean? Right. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Well, thanks for pointing out that I have a man card, you know, Dove. And I, yeah, I've got that. <laughs> um, you know, so people ask this question and, and I think it's a really reasonable question. Now, women, mm -hmm. women want to know what's your thing, right? Why yeah. are you, why are you doing this? And, it, and I, it's very reasonable because I think women uh, often are sorting out, like, what's this guy's motivation? If he's well, talking yeah, about hard to trust, right? Yeah, right. And so for me, I'll, I, I'm really happy to share that, you know, there are two factors here. Number one uh, is, you know, I'm a, I'm a research geek for the last 30 years, looking at mentoring, sponsoring research. And I've always seen the, the delta between men and women in terms of who gets the mentoring, who gets the sponsoring. Women don't get high quality mentoring relationships and they often don't get sponsored. And I've always been curious because men are in these positions, often senior leadership, where they can mentor and sponsor talented women coming in the door and they don't. And I've always wondered about that just as an academic. So that was part of it. Mm -hmm. But the other part, Dove, and I think you'll find this in a lot of men doing this work, the other piece of it is the personal for me, right? I've got women that I care about. I've got a sister and I've got one daughter-in-law, both of them rock star naval officers. And I was in the Navy, but I watch what they go through daily. You know, they're told they should smile more. They're told that they... If they give a guy feedback, they're being abrasive, right? My sister was even once told, hey, you shouldn't run so fast on those physical fitness tests because it makes the guys feel bad when you beat them. I, I never have this stuff happen to me. And so it's the empathy knowing these women that I, I admire that I think is it's always bothered me, right? So there's 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 a personal case. There's the empathy, yeah. and then by the way, I just want to point out: I teach at the Naval Academy, where there are the roughly, you know, fifteen hundred rock star women that Dave and I call Athena Risings, uh, because these are Athenas who are going on to become officers in the Marine yeah. Corps and Navy. These are the women that I see every day, and I, I if more men could work where I work. I think this would come more naturally to them. Thank you. What about for you, David? What was the what was the pull for you? Yeah, you know, it's it's kind of it's very similar in the fact that you know because Brad and I were teaching together at the Naval Academy and seeing again the challenges that our students, um, in particular the, the women, faced, um, and a lot of it was perception, right? And 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 how they were perceived as being leaders, and and the fact that they deserve the same type of education and training and preparation for combat that the men did, right? Because to do anything less was a disservice to them, uh, to their people, certainly to our country, I think. And I think couching in that way back into kind of leadership terms, I think was really useful and helpful to think about how do we do this. But, but like Brad, I think the personal piece of this, the personal connection, the, it was really important. You know, I, uh, I graduated from the Naval Academy many years ago. I won't say when, but a long time ago. But my wife uh, also is a graduate. You know, we we're the same class. Um, we graduated in the you know back in the early '80s when you know they were first uh, integrating women in there, and it was a very different experience. And and back then, of course, the opportunities weren't the same either. So there was, no. I mean, there was explicit discrimination in terms of women were not given the opportunities that they have today. 
to do that. And, and just watching my wife's career in parallel with mine and all the conversations we had over the years about her experiences. And, and I was just, it was just mind boggling. Like Brad gave you several great examples there about things that they experienced that I just, I never, I never saw it. I never felt it. I never experienced it. When I was looking for advice or guidance or, hey, I wanna do this in my career. Those kind of, those things, I didn't have to look very far. And I certainly didn't have to ask anyone because they mm -hmm. were just kind of given to me. And that's not the case for women. Uh, this information is often kind of held in secret. It's shared in, in other circles that they're not included in. And I think that's part of the challenge there too. But for me, the, the empathy piece of this, I think is important because as I began to understand through her eyes, what she was experiencing, I took that back and went into my own workplace, my own squadron and look at the women there and their experiences and began to make the connections and seeing it's like, wow, this is going on all around me. And I just wasn't aware of it. Yeah. Um, I think that's one of the biggest challenges we, we all have today and why we're still dealing with this is that so many of us as men in particular and, and white majority men that we just haven't experienced this. We don't have, we, we can't see it. So if you haven't experienced it, you can't see it. It's really hard to fix it. I think yeah. as leaders, this is where the, we got to start with the awareness piece and building that awareness. Cause once I see it and I understand it, it's like, all right, now I can fix the problem. Now I can, I can understand how, and not fixing women, right? But fixing, how do I change things in the workplace, the practices, the things that are creating this, these inequities. And, and, and Brad and I find that, you know, from a research perspective, this is really helpful because so many leaders today, they, they want to know best practices, but they also want them to be evidence-based. And, and again, the research is really important to, to making sure we can do that. And these, these are all great points. Um, and, and really what you said in there, I think is vital for us all to grasp. Um, <clears throat> you know, when we talk about racial discrimination as well, we, mm. we have the same issue, mm. which is it's not real for me, mm. right? For me. Mm -hmm. And, and nothing is real. This is part of the human condition. We are, we all got the psychology backgrounds here. Uh, and the, the psychology background tells us that human beings, nothing is real until it's real for them. You know, so when we have a personal experience of it, suddenly, like, oh, my God, but these things are around us and they're glaring and occasionally we get a glimpse of it, but it's kind of almost like we don't realize we're in our own, um, we're in our own uh, bubble that allows us to be ignorant. And, and I, I found it interesting what you were saying there, David, is that, you know, you and your wife graduated together. And so you could actually see a parallel path. I can't get any mentoring. Oh, I got 15 people offering me mentoring. I can't find out how to get into this. Oh, I, I, I was given that. And, and until you were doing that, it, you know, it's, it's fascinating. I don't think that we grasp it. It's like we're, we're in our bubble, we're in our own seat club. And then the other side of it is that we create the same thing on the other side. And so oftentimes, and correct me if I'm wrong, but oftentimes I feel like women, I, the women I've dealt with in leadership feel like certainly in the past that they were dealing with the fragile egos of men. Like Brad was saying, don't run so fast, you know, make the guys feel bad. Screw them. I'm faster than I eat less potatoes, run faster. I mean, you know, so it talk to us about that side of it, which is, uh, the other side of it is women, because I think you're probably doing this education on both sides, is that women are feeling like, yeah, I'd like to go and help men, but, you know, they've all got such freaking fragile egos. Yeah. What do I do? So talk to us about it from that side. Yeah, well, and, and just, just start off with that great question, Dove. I mean, uh, one of our messages, hey, this is not your job to women, right? You've, you've been... You've been carrying the load for the last however many decades on gender equity. So the idea that you now have to take your time to educate men about, you know, gender inequities all around them in the workplace, no. So, uh, you know, a big piece of our message to men is this whole allyship thing begins with self-education, right? So Yes. Watch, watch Dove Barron's, watch Dove Barron's leadership podcast, read good guys. Um, there's so much available information. If you are invested in being part of the solution when it comes to gender equity, 
you need to start with self-education. After you do that, and to your point about why women might just be rolling their eyes about having to bring men along, after I've done the self-education, now I can really think about, do I have some trusting relationships with some women? You know, we heard men call these in our interviews for good guys. We heard men refer to these as their gender confidants, right? These were those women that they had worked hard to establish trust with. And they had done things like say, hey, I was just reading this or I listened to Dove's podcast on and gender equity came up. I've been really thinking about this. Would it be okay if I asked you about your experience here in the company, right? That, that real humble, I'm really curious. I'd like to understand what your experience is, but I'm going to ask to ask. I won't assume that you want to share that with me, but I want to show you that I'm, I'm open to learning. So I've done the self-education. I've established some trusting relationships with some female colleagues. That's where it really begins. And I think message to women is, are there some of those guys around you who really show the genuine interest, the curiosity, the humility? Those are the guys I would begin with. Because if you can get them on board, now you can, you can begin this male allyship movement. And that's a great thing, too, uh, that you said, because, you know, about asking to ask, because on the other side of it, um, there are many men, as you say, who are good guys. And I talked about it in the intro, hmm. who were like, mm, I don't know. I'm kind of like, I feel like I'm stepping on, you know, I'm walking around on eggshells here. I don't know what to say. And that, that piece of guidance there alone is that's what the price of admission, which is ask if it's okay to ask. You know, I saw a wonderful, uh, wonderful short video about um, understanding African Americans and who might be your friends. And the, the number one question, ask if you can ask, right? Um, and, and, it, and, the, and the answer was very simply this first, Google it first, yeah. And then ask if you can ask. Right? Yeah. So, and so it was like, you know, can I touch your hair? No. Um, you know, no. <laughs> uh, can I touch your hair? No. Okay. Well, good. So we know that, right? So, but Googling first and then getting a rough idea and saying, you know, I've read this. Is it okay if I ask you about that? No, it's not. I feel like that's kind of yucky. Okay. Yeah. So I love, you know, it's the same principle. And it's this principle about, you know, and you guys will understand this. And this is, you've heard me talk about this before as, as the audience, you've heard me say, you know, you've got to remember that we are one of the, one of the bonding hormones is oxytocin. Oxytocin happens when we hug each other. It happens when we make love. It happens when we have babies, but oxytocin is also the othering hormone. It's the hormone that tells us you're a member of my tribe. And, and, and you're, uh, or they are the other tribe. And if your tribe is men, which is why I personally hate, and I know it's a strong word, but it's, I don't use that word very often, but I hate the idea of men are from Mars, women are from Venus. It mm. drives me mental. Yeah. Yeah. Personally, I get very upset about it because it's othering. And let's not do that. Instead, let's understand the how are we the same let's find the ways that we're the same yeah there's differences so what there's differences between brad me and david right you know i mean brad's got far darker hair than uh, david's got far darker hair than brad and i you know <laughs> let's start there you know i don't know if it's grecian don't know if it's, <laughs> it's a secret oh, no. you know it's, it's yeah. a military secret it'll have to be kept quiet but, you know i mean so we have to get through all these othering dynamics that we do so you know I, I really i want to i want to understand this part because i want the guy who is a bit fearful and a bit on the eggshells david where do you come from in that context when you're stepping into that, when a guy was like, I'd yeah. like to be an ally, but mm, I'm afraid you know, of being of, attacked. One of the things that we find is, again, like you said at the beginning, I think most men, no surprise, probably everybody listening on this podcast here, um, they're either good guys that believe in gender equity and gender equality, or they're looking to, to do more, right? They're, hey, mm -hmm. I recognize that, 
you know, I, 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 there's more that I can be doing to create the solution here, but I'm not sure what that is. But one of the one of the challenges in particular we find is that a lot of us believe in this, but and then we think we're doing everything we can be doing, but we're not, right? Mm. And, and we find this in the research that uh, that women say, no, you're actually not doing everything you could be doing. And here's a here's a whole litany of things that you could be doing more of that would actually make a difference in the workplace. So understanding what that delta is is really important. Part of that, it goes back to having the humility, having a learning orientation that, first of all, I don't have all the answers. Wow, that's a big one for us as guys sometimes is saying, I don't know. Those are three hard words to say. Let me say it again. I don't know. Uh, that it's okay. It's okay to say, I don't know. And this is part of learning, right? That you're, if you want to ask somebody about their experiences and learn, you're going to have to acknowledge, I have a little humility here, some vulnerability. I don't have all the answers as a leader and I need to learn from you. And, and oh, by the way, not only learn from you, but when I'm actually doing the work and thinking I'm, as I begin to develop this awareness, all right, so these are the things I need to be saying and doing. How effective am I? Am I actually achieving the result? And this is yes. one of the things back to, this happens in race and other dimensions of diversity too, that we think we're doing it right. We think we're being an ally, but are we really being effective in achieving the results? Or are we, is it performative or is it just not landing the way it needs to? And, and so we need the feedback. And this is the really hard part about being an ally, I think, in, in, for men in particular, that We've got to welcome and ask for and demand. We want that feedback from, from other people who are different from us, in this case, women. Um, hey, I need to hear that. And we got to have those trusting relationships like Brad was talking about, have the gender confidence so that, you know, um, my gender confidence might say, hey, uh, Dave, let me talk to you about something. You know, today in the meeting when you said that and all the women rolled their eyes, here's why. Mm. Like, oh, my God. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> and then and then make sure when you do get that critical feedback that we respond in a way that that shows that we we value it and we care um, and that we're not going to gaslight women and, and throw it back at them like, oh, you're just being over emotional or too sensitive or, oh, he does that with everybody. No, no. Take the feedback. It's like, thank you. Um, let me let me think about that and how I can put that into action and, and be better at doing it next time. As we draw towards the end of this first part of the show, there is a piece I want to address before we close up the first part. And that is, it's what I, it's, it's, it's a term I use. Okay. And it's, it's a way for people to grasp it. And I always say it's, it's, it's what I call the good German syndrome, right? And the good German syndrome is, um, you know, I, I'm Jewish by birth. I have a bunch of family who, of course, died in World War II uh, um, in the camps, etc. cetera. Um, and I still don't believe that the German people were all Nazis. I believe there was a lot of good Germans who mm. were quiet. You know, as, as Martin Luther King said, you know, for evil to grow, all it takes is for good people to do nothing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and your book is called Good Guys. And, and I immediately, the thing that tugged at me with that was, I wonder how many good guys are saying nothing. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, they don't know what to say because they don't want to rescue a woman because that won't work. That's a dumb thing to do. But at the same time, you know, and they don't want to be that hero, um, but they don't know how to step in. I, I really want to, can I just throw that to you guys as we finish up this first part? Because I think that so many guys are like, yeah, my boss says it. And I don't want to put my job on the line. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's kind of a dick to women, but I don't know how to, can you guide us a little bit on that? Because I really want guys to grasp that part. Yeah, yeah, and we'd love to talk about this stuff. I mean, it, and I, and this is so important that we don't shame men about this because it, it happens to all human beings. But when it comes to the gender stuff, the misogyny, the bias, the sexism, the jokes that are not appropriate, you're, we've all been in that meeting. One of those things happens and we freeze, right? And there's good mm -hmm. research on this in social psychology on the bystander effect within, yep. within just two to three seconds bystander paralysis sets in, right? And, and if I don't disrupt it within two to three seconds, 
the moment is lost and the chance of anyone saying anything really diminishes. So we encourage men who, who want to be better, have some anxiety about this, just disrupt, right? And a simple way to do this is what Dave and I call the ouch technique, right? What if I just say ouch, right? After that inappropriate joke or comment. Mm. The beauty of that technique is it buys me a couple more seconds while everyone in the room looks at me. And, and now I can articulate, hey, we don't do that here. I didn't find that funny. Uh, I don't like the way you just demean my female colleague. I'm going to make I statements and own it. The other piece of this, so Dove, is there, I, there's not an easy, simple answer. And you were alluding no. to this, right? What if it's my boss? Yeah. So, so Dave and I say, you gotta, you've got to disrupt it if you want to be a, a better ally. But you've got to make the calculus. Do I do it right there in the meeting? Or do I go to this guy afterward, right? And, you know, so... If it's your boss and, and the comment wasn't so egregious that it's going to be so toxic, it affects the whole workplace. Maybe I go to him afterward, close the door and say, dude, when you said that today, it was really inappropriate. And everybody in the room cringed. I'm sharing this with you in a spirit of carefrontation, meaning I want you to get better. I care enough about you to tell you that, because if you don't improve your game, uh, in the way that you treat both men and women, you're not going to make it as a leader. It's not going to work for you. And, it, and it's negatively affecting all of us. I think you have to have some courage to do that carefrontation, even if it's a senior guy, your boss, um, you know, some older guy who just doesn't get it. I have to do that. But, but at other moments, that comment's so inappropriate. I'm sorry. I'm doing the ouch. And I'm calling you out right there in the meeting. I can't let that pass. Yeah, I, I you know, you're talking about um, you're talking about uh, self education, and and that of course is important. But also, you know, if you're if you consider yourself a leader, whether you're a manager or a VP, an executive, whatever it is, you gotta have courage, man. You gotta have courage. You gotta stand up for what you believe in, uh, and and that sometimes has a consequence. We are already at the end of uh, this particular episode of part one of our delicious conversation with Dr. Brad Johnson and Dr. David Smith. Um, they are the authors of The Good Guys and Athena Rising. You can find out about both books. But as we close up, gents, would you please uh, tell us where you people can find out more about you, the work you guys do, and the books? Yeah, certainly. Uh, you can go to our website, Workplace Allies, all one word, workplaceallies.com, and you can find more about the books and how to order them. And of course, they're all available through Harvard Business Review Press, and you can see what we've been doing, where we're speaking, and things or other things we're working on. Fabulous. We will make sure, of course, that all that is posted in the show notes. Until just one click away, stay curious, my friends. Stay curious. We're going to come back for part two of our delicious conversation with these very good guys. Stay tuned, stay curious. <laughs>